We're talking tonight about the fossil record, and that's central. Uh, that is a focal point of interest when we're talking about the creation-evolution controversy. If I'm going to debate the subject, and we have on a number of occasions, uh, this is what I want to talk about. This is where I believe we can take a stand that is unassailable and that will persuade. Just uh, wasn't long ago we had a debate scheduled uh, in Louisiana, LSU. The head of the geology department had agreed to debate. It had been set up for about six months, and we got there, the auditorium was full, uh, over 600 people, and the professor didn't show, uh, so I won. <laughs> we lectured for about an hour, and then had Q&A for another hour, and some of them stayed till midnight. Uh, it's interesting that the organization that put that on uh, made them fill out cards when they came in, and uh, they had determined that 54% of them were creationists when they came in, which meant, I think, a disproportionate amount were interested in the evidence and the, the controversy, see how the facts stacked up. But they followed up two weeks later, and it wasn't 54%, it was 87% of creationists. So teach him not to show up. <laughs> uh, but this is what we were talking about, the fossil record. And uh, it is just, we, we get the impression sometimes we're intimidated. The fossils say evolution, and that's just not the case at all. I hope that becomes obvious before we're finished tonight. Well, we didn't get to the beginning. By the way, that's part of my museum. Everybody has that in their living room. <laughs> uh, we'll get to the beginning here in a minute. All right. Let me skip part of it, but... We want to emphasize this is the evidence. If evolution is true, and if it's going to be proved, this is where it's at. This is where they have to prove their case. Uh, S.M. Stanley is one of the better-known paleontologists in the country at Johns Hopkins University, and he made this acknowledgement. He said, the fossil record, and only the fossil record, provides direct evidence of major sequential changes in the Earth's biota. Lots of uh, implications and inferences, but direct evidence would have to come from the fossil record. And then he acknowledges it's doubtful whether in the absence of fossils, the idea of evolution would be anything more than an outrageous hypothesis. Uh, I think he's right, and I think <laughs> he has to face the absence of fossils as far as evidence for evolution is concerned. Uh, I'd like to ask you to remember this statement, outrageous hypothesis is his conclusion if the fossils don't support what he's saying. How do you look at the fossils and determine what is or isn't in favor of evolution or creation? Um, I think they're contrasting predictions, and this is one of the ways we proceed in science. You have a question, okay, if this is true, you see this. If this is true, you ought to see that. And so when you begin to investigate, you see which one's predictions come true, or, or prove to be true. The evolutionist, of course, uh, is making exactly the opposite predictions of the creationist. And I think we can look at the fossil record and look at the beginning. And they talk about a simple, gradual uh, progression upward, uh, whereas the evolutionist says, no, it's uh, abrupt, 
right from the start. Um, there ought to be a progression gradually moving upward. On the other hand, the creationist says, no, it should be stasis, that is status quo, that stays the same, distinct and separate. And we ought to be able to look at the fossil record and tell. Some people say, well, if you see similarities, you see evidence of evolution. Well, actually, I think similarities are a prediction of both models, uh, but they're different, and we should be able to tell the difference. The evolutionist would say uh, there should be a branching pattern, like nested tables, gradually connected, developing upward, whereas uh, the creationist says, yes, there are similarities, but it's due to a common designer, uh, a mosaic pattern. So you've got a blue tile here where the designer wants it, or a blue tile here. It doesn't have to be connected, one leading to the other. But similarities due to common design. Different patterns, and we should be able to look at the record and see which of the two are reflected. Now, how do you know what is in the fossil record? I can tell you it's abrupt and sudden and doesn't fit into a branching pattern, and that wouldn't impress a lot of people. And so we're going to allow the evolutionist to describe the facts. He's going to test, or they will testify from their conviction, uh, not wanting usually to overemphasize their problems, but I want you to understand, I don't want to misrepresent these people. They're all devout evolutionists. They are men of great faith, but it's faith in evolution. Now, when you're in court, if you have testimony from someone who is a friend, that, that will help, but then he's a friend. You know, you don't expect him to say something favorable. But if the enemy acknowledges that which is contrary to his interest when he doesn't really want to, that's really more powerful and more weighty evidence. And so we're looking at the evolutionist testifying contrary to their interest, uh, but acknowledging what the facts are. We'll begin with Richard Dawkins, uh, certainly an enemy as far as the idea of evolution is concerned. Uh, sometimes, as we've indicated, uh, referred to as the Pope of evolution. Beginning is the most critical part. How would he describe the beginning of the fossil record. Right at the start, he says, we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. And now, you think about that statement a minute. How is it a state of evolution if, boom, that's the first time they appear? That, that's almost a contradiction in terms. Uh, but his faith in evolution says that's what I'm seeing, in spite of the fact that it just appears suddenly. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. No evolutionary history, just planted, but that's evolution. Now, that's exactly what we would predict, and the opposite of what he would predict that he acknowledges. Uh, needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted the creationists. Well, I'll plead guilty. That's what we predict. That's what we see. Uh, and that's one of the ways that we evaluate the record. When you look at National Geographic's description of the beginning of the fossil record, the, the Cambrian, that lowest layer we talked about last evening, uh, this is their description, an explosion of life. Now, that's not the slow, gradual beginning progressive upward, that's boom, there it is. And that's the description of the enemy of the beginning of the fossil record, the Cambrian period. Uh, Stephen Gould is probably the most famous paleontologist in our country, recently deceased, uh, from Harvard, wrote in Natural History for 30 years, his column every month. Uh, he says the Cambrian explosion occurred in a geological moment, and all the major anatomical designs may have made their evolutionary appearance at that time. 
it's the beginning, it's an explosion, and boom, they appear, but it's an evolutionary appearance. He says, well, that's not what it looks like, even from his description. And all the major anatomical designs, now he doesn't believe they were designed, but that leaked in because that's what it looks like. Uh, we caught him saying what he doesn't believe. Uh, if you've got all the major anatomical designs from the start, does that look like this gradual, slow progression, or boom, there it is? Uh, he's acknowledging exactly what we would predict. Not only the phylum, the phylum is the major division in biology, not only the phylum chordata, that's the highest order, highest because that's us, our prejudice, uh, the animals with the backbones, uh, the highest, not only the phylum chordata, but all of its major divisions. Here's right at the start, not what's supposed to be at the beginning, but the highest from the beginning and all the major divisions up. Now, if I were writing this, I don't think I could have written it, made it up so that it fit our predictions any better. But this is the most famous evolutionist, perhaps, in the country. Uh, contrary to Darwin's expectations, this is not what's expected. This is not the prediction, which is devastating if you're trying to objectively evaluate the evidence. Since the so-called Cambrian explosion, you'll see it gets even worse. No new phyla of animals uh, have entered the fossil record. Right at the beginning, all the major divisions, all the major anatomical designs and the, the, the divisions of the highest order, and no new in sense. Now, again, if I'm trying to make this up, I couldn't have written it any better. This is exactly what the creationist predicts. And this is exactly what the evolutionist acknowledges is the case. Maxwell Maltz, University of Texas, puts it this way. He says, the Cambrian explosion, it wasn't a gradual development of complexity. Now, that's what's predicted. It wasn't. But it's like it burst out of a magic box. <laughs> He's not a creationist. <laughs> He's an evolutionist. But burst out of a magic box? What does that sound like? It was not what they predict. It is exactly what we predict. And this is the antagonistic witness. Notice the description here from the Evolutionary Journal. 2012, he said, fossils from the Cambrian period can cause a real headache for evolutionary biologists. Now, why would that be? Because it doesn't fit the prediction. It's not what they're looking for. That's just, it doesn't cause a headache to the creationists. It's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, the, the, uh, you expect single organisms evolving over time, become increasingly more complex. Uh, that's the prediction. However, during the Cambrian period, there was apparent uh, explosion of the major groups of animals, all appearing simultaneously. That's a headache for the evolutionist. That's not what he predicts. It's exactly what we predict. And over and over again, you see that. Uh, here's the geologic column that represents their stack in terms of gradual evolution uh, over millions of years. Uh, it burst out of a magic box, complex, suddenly, right at the beginning. Now, these are the statements of the evolutionists themselves describing what you see in the at the beginning of the fossil record, and then no new phylum since. Do I have to even ask, what does that look like? Which model is served best by the evidence? 
exactly the opposite and a headache. This is not my evaluation. This is the antagonistic witness that's described here. But this is what you see in the textbook. The, the, the simplest organism at the bottom gradually working its way up to the chordata, which are at the top in this drawing, but that's the way it starts in the fossil record. Notice Gould's description of this, quote, tree of life in all of the biology textbooks. Evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. It is not the evidence of the fossils. Now, that's it. When, when you see that, and you see it in all of the textbooks, just know, turn it upside down, it's closer to what you see in the fossil record. It is not the evidence of the fossils, according to the antagonistic witness, and yet this is what we see continually as a representation of the development of life. Well, where did that come from? Uh, we start from this textbook at the two different state universities, uh, Evolution of the Earth. We have arranged the groups in a traditional way. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> talked last night about arranging the layers. Well, you arrange the fossils. You arrange them with the simplest forms first, the progressively more complex following. We, they're put that way in the book because you arrange them that way, not because of the fossils, in spite of the fossils. This particular arrangement is arbitrary. Now, that's somewhat overstating the case because you go on on the same page and he'll show is not totally arbitrary. There is a basic fundamental principle that they use when they're building this tree. It is not the fossils, but it is the fact that they assume if they're similar, they're kin, and the more similar, the more kin, or at least that's the principle. They don't follow it consistently by any means. But they're alike because they're related. The less they look alike, the further removed they are from their common ancestor. Well, we see obvious similarities, don't we? We won't get personal, but we can, we can see some similarities between men and the apes. The question is not whether we see similarities, but why. Now, the evolutionist doesn't ask that question. He knows it's because of evolution. But you look at similarities as you drive down a subdivision, and that's because of common genetics? Uh, no, they're not cousins. It's because of a common designer. That explains similarities just as well. It's exactly what we would predict if they're designed. And we're told as you look at the homologous structures, the similarities, for instance, in the pendactyl form of the vertebrate hand, obvious similarity. Now, the question, if you ask why, which they don't, is either common designer or common uh, genetics. Either would produce similarities, but there is a difference in what would be produced, and that difference provides a test. When you look at the embryology, where these hands, if you please, come from, out of the embryo, you see that the hand, for example, of the newt comes from segments two through five. The lizard doesn't come from the same source in the embryo, uh, six through nine. Man comes 13 through 18. They have similar forms, but they don't come from common genetics. They come from different parts of the embryo. They develop differently. The homologous embryology doesn't work just the outward physiology. And so I think we have an, exa an example of an advantage. We can explain it at least as well. I think we can explain it better. And they have a serious problem. But still, here is the common representation. And supporting that, we'll see what I think is an outdated claim, and maybe you'll see why, that Apes and men are just almost the same thing. 98, 99, have you heard that? The DNA is just almost identical. 
Richard Dawkins says the chimpanzee, uh, chimpanzee and we share more than 99% of our genes. Okay, we're just almost apes according to that. Um, that's more of what we were talking about the other night. That's hogwash. It's outdated. Uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, 2014. Now, what we saw from Dawkins was 30 years old. Bill Nye, the science guy, was, ought to be more up to date. But he, he says uh, we share around 98% of our gene sequence with the chimpanzee. But let's look at the technical journals who have measured and hear from Science 2007 uh, relative difference, the myth of 1%. This idea that they're just 1% different, that's a myth, and that's the headline of the article in Science. Studies are showing that humans and chimps are not as similar. And now, we, with a common designer, we would expect similarities, uh, but they're just not telling the truth about the degree. Uh, many tend to believe it's not, he said, it's not like that. Chunks of missing DNA, extra genes, um, the, the structure is different. They confound any quantification of humanness and chimpness. It's so different. The structure is different. So much so that it confounds any percentage quantification. It, you can't say it's 2%, 3%, 10%. It, it's just so different you can't do that. In Nature, more up-to-date here from 2010, uh, comparison now reveals they offer, uh, the, uh, they differ radically uh, in sequence structure, in gene content. The chimpanzee genome is 10 to 15 percent longer. Does that sound like two percent difference? Uh, 50% of the human genes are missing from the chimp. Does that fit with what the teacher's been telling you? Uh, and this is from Nature, the leading science journal in the world. One third more gene categories, entirely different classes of genes. Now, they're just not telling the truth. Nature knows what it's talking about. Um, I think nature knows more than Bill Nye, the science guy. You certainly do see similarities, but when you look carefully, at, and, and when you're talking about fossils and relating it to evolution, you don't just look at the fossils. That, those are just dead things in the rock. The similarities are what it's all about, and that's what you have to look at. You look at these two fish and they look similar, right? I see some heads nodding and I caught you because neither one of them are fish. Uh, they look like fish, but they're not. Uh, we've got one as a mammal, one as a reptile. But it looks like a fish, and so things are kin to each other if they're similar unless they're not. And many times they're not. It indicates common ancestry, except when it doesn't. And often it doesn't, as you can see here. Dramatically often it doesn't. Let's talk about what would be man's closest relative if this principle of closeness indicates relative kinship were true. Blood serum is something we're often referred to when we're talking about similarities, especially with the chimp, and there they are very similar. Uh, in fact, you can use, uh, if the right antiserum is used, you can actually use some of the plasma from the chimpanzee. Very similar. But that's not always the case. You look at milk chemistry, the closest relative is the donkey. And maybe looking at some of your friends, you can say, yeah, that makes sense to me. <laughs> but that's not the chimp. Uh, the cockroach, <laughs> I'm not 
kidding. Here's the one that's very can. Notice here in Science News 2016. If you're looking at milk chemistry, uh, cockroach milk could be the new superfood. It's among the most nutritious substances on earth, three times richer in calories than buffalo milk, which was a previous top contender. Ah, uh, well, okay. It's not the ape, it's the cockroach. Does that fit the picture that's taught in the books? What about uh, cholesterol? We're all interested in cholesterol today. The closest relative is the garter snake. It has cholesterol just like us, or very similar. Uh, teeth, that's something that uh, geologists are interested in that's very resistant to decay, and so that's pretty good evidence when you're trying to put together evidence for men. What's the closest relative? Well, it may be the ape, but then not really. Uh, fish, some of them have teeth just like us. Some of you may get envious when they look here at <laughs> their sheep head. Uh, that's some pretty good looking teeth. Uh, the ape doesn't have teeth like that. Very, well, <laughs> relatively different. But the sheep's head, wow, look at those teeth. Uh, some of you would really <laughs> enjoy teeth like that. Uh, the parrotfish, likewise, has very similar teeth, much more so than the ape. And so when we're looking at man's closest relatives, we've got to go to the fish instead of the ape. In terms of foot structure, which we're interested in when we're looking at the footprints down at Glen Rose, people, you know, many will say, well, maybe it was an ape that was doing this. Well, in terms of the the tree of life, evolution, apes and men are pretty much together. They're all at the top, so it wouldn't, that with the dinosaur would be just as devastating as man, so that wouldn't help. But then the ape has a hand for a foot. You can see the difference between the ape foot and the man foot just, well, it's not even close. But when you look at the glacial bear, uh, you have to take the claws out, and of course he's a quadruped, but that foot is just very, very similar, and if you skin it and just look at the skeleton and remove the claws, you can hardly tell the difference. You can with the ape, but not with the glacial bear. In terms of tear enzyme, we need something to help fight bacteria. Uh, the chicken needs that when they're producing eggs. Uh, and these are like little Pac-Men that run around eating bacteria, the lidosome. Very complex chemical, exactly the same in a chicken and a man, or almost precisely the same. And the nematode has the same thing the chicken has that we have. All three have that to fight bacteria, a very complex chemical. Uh, in terms of blood antigen A, our closest relative is the butter bean. You see the mosaic pattern that we're talking about here. Brain hormone. Okay, who's got brain hormone? What's got brain hormone like us? Well, here comes the cockroach again. <laughs> not, uh, not kidding. Here's from Discover Magazine. Don't squash that roach, he may be your cousin. Cockroach and man, it seems, share not a similar, but a common brain hormone. So I like to talk about similarities. They indicate common ancestry unless they don't. And many times they don't. And so it is very highly selective. You pick this one, you hope they don't find out about the others. When you put the whole picture together, you've got a very different picture. This is a mosaic pattern. This is not a branching pattern. And I think that should be obvious. The fossils, the evidence, if you look at the beginning, it's complex and abrupt and diverse right from the start. No new phyla since. 
that's the evidence. The trees, they are from selected similarities in order to produce the picture that they have arranged and selected ahead of time. Similarities, it shows a branching pattern. I'm sorry, not a branching pattern. It shows a mosaic pattern uh, that is exactly what we predict and the opposite of what the evolutionists predict. So that, that's a, a summary of the evidence that ought to cause pause to someone who says, well, this is, this is saying evolution. When you look at the beginning, when you look at the trees, you look at the similarities, there's no question who is winning the battle. And you can see why I like to debate the fossil record. This is something I have fun with and watch them squirm. Uh, well, what about the transitional forms? If you're going to see evolution in the fossil record, this is what you would have to find. It, it changes from one to the other, and you can see the lineup that would indicate that if you're going to show evolution. Many people think this is what convinced Darwin. No. Uh, innumerable fossil forms must have existed, Darwin says, in the book Origin of the Species. Why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the earth? He didn't have an answer for that, except in future years we will fill in the gaps. That's his prediction. Well, did we do that? He acknowledges geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this is perhaps the greatest objection that can be urged against my theory. This is not something that supported Darwin. This is not why he reached the conclusion of evolution. This was the objection. This was the problem he was wrestling with and predicted that in time the gaps would be filled in. Well, one of the leading authorities today is David Rapp, we introduced last evening. He is the curator of the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History, largest fossil museum in the United States, a great museum. And here is one of the, the head honchos there at the, the museum, and here's what he says about it. He says Darwin was embarrassed by the fossil record because it didn't look the way he predicted it would. Well, we're now 120 years after Darwin and the knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. We now have a quarter of a million fossil species. If it's gonna fill in, we'd know, wouldn't it? We have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation hasn't changed much. Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. It was a problem. It's gotten worse, not better. He predicted it would be filled in. His prediction fell flat on his face. By this I mean, talking about it getting worse, uh, by this I mean some of the classic cases of Darwinian change in the fossil record, such as the evolution of the horse in North America. Well, everybody's seen the picture, the diagram of the fossil horses, and they're supposed to go from the little bitty one up to the great big one. Well, we've got little bitty ones and great big ones that are walking around today together, but he's talking about some differences. Uh, that, he says, that classic case of the horse has to be discarded. Did you know that had been discarded? No, that's what David Rapp says. But this is the picture that you see in the textbook, beginning with the one up at the top, the Dawn horse, uh, one of the big problems is they don't have all of the evidence. And what we see here in the middle is a representation of one that uh, I helped excavate near Lubbock, and several have been excavated, one even bigger than this one uh, in Arkansas. Uh, and this is a giant, well, it almost sounds like you're cussing when you tell the name with the, the gigantic ass. Um, but this one was nine feet tall at the shoulder, a donkey. How many nine foot tall at the shoulder donkeys have you seen? It's not 
the way you see them. And they're even bigger in Arkansas. And some would say, yep, I can imagine that. Uh, but the, the first one <laughs> is uh, the beginning of the record is usually the most interesting. Hydrocatherium is a fancy name that was uh, assigned by Richard Owen, uh, who established the British Museum of Natural History. The word means like a hydrax. Well, a hydrax is kind of like a little rabbit, a rodent-type critter, rock coney, sometimes referred to, uh, mentioned in Proverbs, some of you may remember. It's not like a horse, it's like a hydrax. That's what he said to begin with. Uh, this is the way they look. Uh, and according to the authorities here from Natural History, this is 2024, Eohippus was in fact so uh, unhorse-like, Eohippus, uh, Hydrocatherium, same critter, um, that its evolutionary relationship to the modern horse was at first unsuspected. It's like a hydrax. Not like a horse, but they assigned it afterwards. Um, and so here in 2024, the first ancestral horse is designated correctly as Hydrocatherium, like a Hydrax. No, it, they say it's like a horse. Maybe you could put a saddle on him. I don't know, but I don't think he looks like a horse at all. Uh, and they didn't think so to begin with. They didn't even suspect it. But that's where they put him because they needed somebody there. Others look at it and reach different conclusions. Here from Wikipedia, hydraxes are sometimes described as being the closest living relative to the elephant. Does that look like an elephant to you? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, but you need him in the evolution of the horse for that diagram, and so that's where they put him in spite of the fact they're trying to say, well, he's closer to an elephant, but he's like a hydrax. <laughs> Does that sound scientific to you? Uh, many just not so sure. That's, <laughs> I can understand that. The horse story then leaves us with a few others after that first one. Interestingly, if you go to the Ashfall fossil beds, Oriel, Nebraska, you'll find one ash fall deposit from a volcanic eruption, and you've got all of those representatives after the first one. That first one's not there, the hydraxes. But the rest of them are represented there, two toes, three toes, one toes, all of them side by side covered by a volcanic ash. One didn't evolve from the other or to the other. They were all living together. They were varieties, and some of them have become extinct. That's a downhill process, not up. We've just lost a bunch of them. Uh, that's not the picture of evolution. The first one was either a hydrax or an elephant, <laughs> not a horse. The rest of them lived side by side. How, now, you see why Rapp says it has to be discarded. We might throw that one out. That's one of the classic cases. And that's what's been happening to Darwin's examples. One of the examples of the transitional form that you see in your biology textbook would be Archaeopteryx. Now here is half lizard and half bird, we're told, and this is supposed to lead to uh, the birds from the lizards. And he's got teeth, and that proves that he's primitive. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, we see some birds that have teeth and some don't. Some hummingbirds have teeth. Uh, there's a variety that we see today, and, and a number of birds have teeth. Um, there's some reptiles that have teeth and some that don't. And some amphibians have teeth and some don't. Some mammals have teeth and some don't. You know where I'm going, don't you? Some of you have teeth and some don't. What does that say about evolution? 
it just shows a variety that doesn't say a thing about evolution. But we're told this beautiful fossil of a bird, uh, which, by the way, is not the earliest form. You've got birds lower. That it's supposed to have led to birds, but perfectly good birds got there first. But it has claws on the end of the wings, and that proves it's primitive. But you look at other birds today, a number of them have claws on the wings, like Coatsen down in South America. If we've still got them flying around and they're good birds, what's the problem? You know, that's, that's just the best they can do. The whale gets a lot of attention today, and we're told here is a, and you really need some help when you're trying to put, put that into the picture of evolution because he evolved up to a mammal on land and then went backwards into the ocean and uh, gets into the ocean and you really have some very sophisticated adaptations that have to develop trying to feed a baby underwater. Can you imagine? They do, and they do it well. Uh, I think they were designed for it. But here's news that we've got a four-legged whale. Okay, that would... Sound kind of like uh, an evolutionary link, wouldn't it? Uh, this was announced in 21, National Public Radio. Scientists discover fossils of a four-legged whale. Uh, Newsweek uh, says, scientists who found the fossil of a deadly four-legged whale. They've learned even more about it. The New York Post, uh, fossils... Previously unknown four-legged whale found. Uh, BBC, uh, new species, ancient four-legged whale. It's just around the world, all the news media here, we've got, and they're looking for some help with the evolution of the whale. And this looks like something that would really fit the picture. Well, here are the men that found it. And yes, National Public Radio and Newsweek are all listed. That's their picture. You see the legs? <laughs> no, you don't. But that is what they found. That's it. And when you look at the technical journal that described the find, the Proceedings of the Royal Society, the red part represents what was actually found. The rest is what they provided. And you remove what they provided, and that's him. What happened to his legs? Pure speculation. It ought to be, if evolution is true, they ought to find something. But And they just say that's what it is when it's not there at all. Did he have four legs? Who knows? Or flippers? Who knows? A whale? Nothing to do with it. Who knows? That's what they have. Now, that's the kind of thing that goes on. And sometimes you have to go to the technical journals to see what's really happening. Newsweek. National Public Radio don't necessarily tell the whole story. Uh, Stephen Stanley, the paleontologist from Johns Hopkins, says, in fact, the fossil record does not convincingly document a single transition from one species to another. There are a few of them that will just fess up and tell the truth. Uh, most of them will say, yeah, there are a few. There are not many, but there." he just says, I don't know of any. And he had discussed the hoax of the four-legged whale as well. Uh, in terms of fossil transition, I think Gould really summarized the picture accurately. Just before he passed away, he uh, published his tome, this huge book that is a summary of his life work. And here is perhaps the most famous paleontologist in the country summarizing it. And the theme that he says dominates is stasis. Uh, we got a little bit of formatting problem because we don't, we don't have the same fonts I do. But that's all right. Stasis, according to Wikipedia, uh, says it, it, like Status quo stays the same. No evolutionary change is what stasis means. And that's what dominates the fossil record, according to this 
that's one of the main themes. He defines stasis this way, spread across several million years, no net change from the beginning and end, uh, similarity uh, substantially the same. That's what stasis is. Now, what does he say about stasis and the fossil record? Most common pattern, this is his, he, his words, the most common pattern in the fossil record, the primary signal of the fossil record, Darwin's expectations defined evolution as gradual change, uh, Stasis can only mean uh, sorrow and disappointment in, in terms of what is expected by Darwin. It's a complete disappointment. Empirical signal of quite stunning contrariness. Uh, th these are rather sophisticated uh, words to say it ain't happening. It's not there. Uh, empirical falsification. Here's the facts, and it refutes the idea of evolution. Uh, now, he is an evolutionist. He believes it devoutly. He's the leader. But in terms of the fossil record, not only is he, I'm just giving you the bottom line. He has chapters showing why he reaches that conclusion and all the statistical analysis of the this is what the leading authority in the world says about it. Now, he passed away uh, in, I think, 2002 after publishing that book. Uh, Donald Prothero is probably the one who's considered now the, and the, the one who's taken over his position as the leader in paleontology in the country. He's written five geology textbooks, uh, professor of geology at California Institute of Technology, and he is commenting on what Google had to say. He said, many paleontologists came forward and pointed out that the geological literature was one vast monument to stasis with relatively few cases where anyone had observed gradual evolution. Monument to stasis, the opposite of evolution. As Gould put it, it was the dirty little secret hidden in the paleontological closet. Paleontologists all over the world saw that stasis was the general pattern, and that is still the consensus 40 years later. Now, if stasis is the consensus of all the paleontologists, it's time for the evolutionists to go home. Uh, that just says, when you look at the fossils, it, they say the opposite. You've got the monument to stasis. You've got transitions. Well, some of them will say there's a few. But here's the primary signal, the consensus, as opposed to maybe a few cases or not one, as Stephen Stanley says. Now, that's a summary of the evidence. What does that look like to you? Who's got the better case? Which model is served best by the evidence? They still believe it, even though they acknowledge the facts are contrary. They see Stuart Cambridge is talking about plant life and botany, and that's his field and acknowledges it's very similar to the others, but he says and he, he, primarily the orchids is his field of authority, but the theoretically primitive type eludes our grasp. Our faith postulates its existence, but the type fails to materialize. Their faith doesn't have the evidence we were talking about Sunday. They believe it, but it's a blind faith in spite of the evidence, not because of it. The primitive type, well, you got an orchid. Okay, where did that come from? Uh, or other orchids. There's no primitive type to look to. And he would love to find it. He believes it, but it's not there. 
as someone said regarding the faith of the evolutionist, it's the substance of fossils hoped for, the evidence of links unseen. That's not what the creationist is depending on. The evidence looks like this, from the antagonistic witness. It was Darwin's biggest problem in his day, as he acknowledged, and it's gotten worse. It was an embarrassment, according to Google. It's been debunked. Uh, it's a headache, but their blind faith continues to believe what has not materialized. It delights the creationist. It's just planted. Uh, you see the advanced state when it starts. Uh, it's an explosion burst out of a magic box. Uh, mosaic similarities and a monument to stasis. Now, just add it up and tell me where the scales go. Is that a hard decision to make? You want to understand and remember what what Stephen Stanley said, uh, well, we've gone the wrong direction here. I was trying to get to the climax there, and we kind of messed it up. Uh, but he was saying it without the fossils, and I think this diagram will show you that it is not on their side. It's on our side. And what was it that Stanley said? If you don't have the fossils, it's an outrageous hypothesis. The evolutionist, who devoutly believes it, says without the fossils, that's where you're at. I think that's where they're at. I think the fossil record is very obviously in favor of creation. Not because of blind faith, in spite of blind faith, or the evolutionist's blind faith, but because that's where the facts lead. It, as we pointed out last night, it's just fun to be a creationist when you just follow the facts. And wow, that just fits exactly what you're predicting. Uh, it's difficult when it doesn't. And uh, I don't feel sorry for those who refuse to follow the facts. I think that's true throughout our Father's world. And the more we see about this world around us, the more obvious that psalm tells the truth. This is our Father's world. And if we just open our eyes, it becomes more and more obvious. And the fossils are just the, the monument to the fact that God did destroy the world by a flood, that not following what he said is serious. You do that or else. And the flood and the billions of dead things and the rocks all over the world are testimony to the fact that God will judge. And there is a great day coming like that one by fire, and you need to make sure you're ready. We want to extend our Savior's invitation this evening, encourage you to come confessing your faith, repent of your sins.